So today's topic is statistics in Six Sigma. It's the, I, I guess the last chapter of Six Sigma, if you have the textbook, after idea generating tools. Those who have the textbook, we can mention the page number in the chat box. So the first one is defect per unit, okay? So when you're working on a Six Sigma project, you have to use accurate measures to understand how you're performing, okay? That is very important to understand your current state of process before making any changes, okay? You should understand what your current process is. So whatever data you collect, whenever you do a statistical analysis on these data, okay? You have to have a clear-cut understanding of what exactly you're searching for. Okay, there are few statistics, uh, statistical uh, formulas that we use here, like defects per unit, DPM or defects per million opportunities. Okay, TPO, these kind of total production uh, uh, unit. Okay, these these kind of different uh, formulas are used. Okay, so for us to understand what is a defect. Okay, D stands for defects in DPU. So defect is a flaw or any discrepancy in an operation or an item an error we can see okay for example a car is one finished unit of a process the final re uh, result is a car okay complete car which you can take it on road okay uh, but it also contains many different parts when a car is assembled maybe the, the tires are uh, manufactured in one state the engine may be manufactured in different state okay um, the 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 car assembly takes place in some other state okay so there are various areas the seats the dashboard engine exhaust system okay each one part is a functional unit and each one of them will have their own set of errors okay there may be 10 errors enlisted in car uh, in in a seat production 20 errors in a engine production okay so each and every part and even errors in assembly may also take place Okay, so 10 defects, uh, 10, 10 defects could be present in 10 different cars, which are a, uh, which are a finished unit. So that is a defect. Okay, defect is not just one part of a car is defective. Okay, if you look at different units in a car, different assembly of the car, that should be, there could be some defect in the engine, some defect in the tire some defect in the seat, material of the seat, okay, which are, which may be manufactured in different states, okay, not in under the same roof, okay. So defects come in different base and forms. So that is what a defect is, error is, okay. So defects per unit, this is, this in this we are finding out the average, okay. So DPU measures the average number of defects for every product unit okay let's say in a in a completely finished car on average there would be three defects okay so how do you how do you find it it is counted you find this this average number by finding out what is the total number of defects found in total number of units okay for example uh, 300 cars are manufactured Okay, in all these 300 cars, how much of our defects are there from seat to engine to dashboard to tires? Okay, each and every part, what is the total number of defects found in the 300 cars that you have manufactured? Okay, that will be the numerator. And what will be the denominator? 300, because you are finding the defects only in the 300 cars. Okay, so the total number of defects that you have counted in each one of the car. 
you have only you, you have only uh, made 300 cars okay out of 300 cars uh, there could be 10 defects in one car two defects in another car five in another car so you will calculate find out the total number of defects which are seen in the final production okay and divided by the number of production okay so total now defects let's say there is there are 1000 defects in all 300 cars included 1000 defects are there 1000 divided by 300 because that that the your manufacturing unit was 1000 okay so that is the dpu is it clear to all Is it clear to all regarding defects per unit? It can also be put as total number of defects found in a sample divided by the sample size. Okay. If you are looking at only 10 cars, 10 cars are your sample size. You only calculate the number of defects that are found in those 10 uh, cars. So that will be your numerator and 10 cars will be your denominator. Okay. So that's how you find the defects per unit. Then you have total opportunities, okay? So uh, what is an opportunity? Opportunity is a potential of something going wrong, okay? But it may go wrong, it may not go wrong, okay? So that is TOP. To So total opportunities, TOP, okay? So what are, what is an opportunity, TOP? It's the potential that things can go wrong. Opportunity is an area where a defect can happen, okay? So again, taking the example of a car, tire, the material of tire is an opportunity where defect can happen, okay? Engine system, that is an opportunity where defect can happen. Seat material, that is another opportunity where defect can take place. Okay. So these are opportunities. So total opportunities in an entire car, a final product of a car. How much opportunities of errors are there in that car? That is total opportunity. So what will be the formula for it? Total number of product units multiplied by opportunities okay so let's say um taking breaking down the car into different areas okay dashboard tire seat seat belt airbag engine music system ac okay so these all are product units in a car because they all are assembled together and finally you get a final car okay so let's say there are around a car has, let's say, for example, okay, 15 
product units. 15 things are assembled and then you finally get a car. 15 things are assembled and that's how you get a car. Okay. So let's say that is the total number of product units. Okay. 15 multiplied by opportunities in, in each of these 15 opportunities. Let's say tire. Tire may have three opportunities where error can happen. Defect can happen. Okay. Uh, dashboard may have uh, 10 opportunities where defect can happen. Seat may have five opportunity where defect can happen. Airbag may have three opportunities where defect can happen. So each of the units, each of the unit in a car will have different uh, points of opportunities where defects can happen. Okay. So that total number you have to multiply by 15. So that's how you get total opportunities. So in an entire car, how many opportunities will be there for things to go wrong? That number you will get. Okay. So total number of defect opportunities in a sample. Uh, if This is just for one car. So if you want to see for an entire sample size, let's say 300 car that is being manufactured. So sample size is 300 multiplied by number of defect opportunities per unit in the sample. So let's say one uh, one uh, one sample one car has 50 areas where defects can take place okay so 300 car will have how many areas where defects can take place okay what will be the total number of defect opportunities in 300 cars so that will be sample size 300 multiplied by 50 because a one car has 50 areas where errors can take place okay so that's how you calculate the total opportunities because when you want to do the final calculation of six sigma to see if this is a six sigma level project or not okay these formulas will be used then you have defects per opportunity, DPO. So this is just cross multiplying, okay? D stands for the defects divided by total opportunities, which we have discussed just now, this formula. If you put this for whatever answer you get here in the first formula, you put that in the denominator and the number of defects, okay? the total number of def defects that you have found, if that is the numerator, numerator divided by TOP, total opportunities. Opportunities will be the denominator, defects, total defects will be the numerator. That's how you get the defects per opportunity, DPO, okay? Or you can use DPU divided by opportunities as well. DPU is the first formula that we have discussed, this one. DPU is the first formula that we have discussed. So whatever answer you get here in DPU, take that as a numerator and opportunities, total opportunities that you have found where potential of error is there. If that you put in the denominator, again, you will get the same answer. Okay, defects per opportunity can be found out. So defects per opportunity, it is a, a process quality in Six Sigma that is used to identify and track a number of defects in a process, okay? In a single process, if you find want to, want to find out how many defects are there, DPO is used, okay? So it is calculated by dividing the number of defects in a process by the number of opportunities for defects. So you two things you have to find out here, you have to count how many mistakes have happened in this process, okay? Divided by how many opportunities of mistakes were already there, okay? Let's say, for example, admission process, okay? In an admission process in a hospital, uh, from start to end of just an admission process, there are 10 areas where defects can take place, okay? 10 steps in admission um, process where defects can take place. So 10 is the opportunity where defects can take place. But it's not necessary that in every admission process, you will find 10 errors. No, certain processes will be defect free. Okay, a staff has done the admission process without any mistake, defect free. 
but some staff has done the admission process, they have caused some error here and there. Okay. So that error that they have caused here and there, that will be the numerator, how many defects that they have done, divided by how many opportunities or defects were already present. Okay. So that's how you find out the defects per opportunity. Okay. Two things you have to uh, count here is how many errors were done, how many uh, mistakes were done, but how many opportunities of mistakes were also there. These two, two, two things, if you have, you can find the DPO. Okay. Then there is DPMO, defects per million opportunities. It has another name also, NPMO, okay, non-conformities. NPMO means non-conformities. It, it's not defects maybe, but it's not the standard area in which uh, uh, how the opportunity or a process should function that is NPO non-conformities okay another name is defect defect is a mistake non-conformity is not a mistake but it's not up to the standard okay so it is also a ratio this is also a ratio in which uh, we have to uh, we, we will understand the number of defects in a sample to a number of defect opportunities multiplied by 1 million. Okay. Defects, or again, it's the same thing you have to, you should have two data set with you. One is how many mistakes were done. Second is denominator, how many opportunities of mistakes were present in the sample and multiply the entire thing by 1 million or 10 lakh. Okay. 1 million is equal to 10 lakh. So that's how you get the DPMO, okay? The same thing that you will, uh, the same data that you have here, how many mistakes happened, how many opportunities were mistakes were there. If you have these two data, multiply this with 1 million or 10 lakh, you get DPMO. That is the only difference, okay? So business that manufactures a product may use DPMO measurement to determine the chances of defects occurring during the production. Okay, and knowing this DPMO value, the business can allocate its available resources properly to potentially prevent and reduce the number of defects. Okay, when you know DPMO, you know exactly which area of your hospital has the highest potential of causing mistakes, errors. Okay, so now you have the resources, budgets, and also the knowledge where things are going wrong. So you can direct your resources, budget, your action plan, towards the area where mistakes happen a lot many times. So you can reduce the number of total mistakes and you can improve the quality in your future. Okay, that is the use of DPMO. It can also give you a good estimation on how efficient your production is. Okay, efficiency is very important in, a, in any business. You can make adjustments also. Because uh, uh, with this data, you can make adjustment, which will give you the most insightful area where how do you have to how how do you have to minimize your cost? Okay, how you can boost your productivity, how you can boost your competitiveness. These things can be found out. Then six sigma level. Why why is the six sigma, not five sigma, four sigma? Okay, what is the importance of six sigma? From where does this word come by? Okay, so to understand that, you have to understand what are the other levels of six sigma. Okay, what are the other sigma levels? Okay, six is one of the sigma sigma level. So looking at this table, you can see. When an industry is performing at one sigma level, their defects per million opportunity is 6,91,462. 1 million, you already know what is 1 million. 1 million is equal to 10 lakh. Okay. So what is one, one sig, uh, sigma level? It means 
your company or your hospital is giving services to 10 million cases sorry 10 lakh cases Uh, am I audible? Is my screen visible? So, let's say your hospital is giving service to 10 lakh cases. Okay, 10 lakh cases was, uh, is given service to in a month or let's say in a year. But out of 10 lakh, 6 lakh 91,000 times defective service was given. Which means, if you put it into percentage, 69% of the service that you gave to your clients, it was defective. It was not of good quality. And only 31% times you gave good quality service. So that is one sigma level. Okay. If it is two sigma level, it's just the opposite. 31 times, 31% 31 of the clients got bad quality service. 69% of the clients got good quality service from your hospital. Okay. Every 10 lakh cases I'm saying. If it is three sigma level, only 6.7 times people faced with quality issues. 93% of the times people were satisfied with your services, they didn't face any quality issue. In four sigma level, 0.62% people faced quality issues. 99.38% people didn't face any quality issue. So coming to six sigma level, 0.0034 times the quality was defective. But 99.99966% times almost 100%, okay, but not exactly 100. Almost 100% of the time you gave quality service because your service level was at six sigma level, which means you had given 10 lakh services. 10 lakh cases were attended in your hospital. But out of that 10 lakh, 3.4 times only people had a bad experience or a quality issue was found out just 3.4 times just imagine the number where is 10 lakh and where is 3.4 10 lakh people you met 10 lakh cases were given service but only 3.4 cases faced quality issues so that is the six sigma level of quality okay is it clear now what is six sigma So coming to data, you have qualitative data, quantitative data, okay, the data that you collect. To find out that where is your sigma level, data has to be collected, right? From 10 lakh, 3.4 times only you messed up. That's the data. You have to collect that information from somewhere. somewhere. That is the data, okay? So data comes in two forms, qualitative and quantitative, okay? Qualitative is uh, you can't put a number value to it, okay? Quantitative, the number values that you gave, the numbers that you gave, it has a value, okay? That is quantitative, okay? Numerical values can be placed on the data that you have collected. In qualitative, numerical values cannot be placed on the data that you have collected. Okay, so qualitative data and quantitative data. Under qualitative data, you have nominal, ordinal, and binary. Okay, nominal, which means you are nominating a category. It's usually categorical. Okay, nominal means you are nominating a category. 
in here the variables or categories they don't have any ranking sequence they don't have an order in which they have to be put okay for example gender when you fill up a form okay in the gender area you have male female or other gender gender columns are there it's not in a particular order that male gender should come first female should be second other should be at the last okay it's not like that there is no particular order it could be could be others male female others female male female others male okay like that there is no specific order in which for, uh, a form should be made race as well okay what is your race people may ask what is your ethnicity or race okay so these are nominee nominal data then you have ordinal data here there is order to the variables or the data that you have collected it has an order it has to follow for example blood, blood group okay we always start with a positive a negative b positive b negative okay like that there is an order in which always a blood group is mentioned if you have to pick your blood group there is an order in which blood groups are mentioned okay you will not start with a b negative o positive then taking a then b okay there's an order alphabetical order is respected here in blood group okay so that's an example of ordinal data then binary from the name itself just two there are only two ways there are only two options either yes or no pass or fail present or absent like that okay so any one you you will belong to any one option okay you have to choose any one option so that is binary Coming to the qualitative data collection, quantitative data collection, you have two types, discrete and continuous. So discrete means uh, it cannot have decimal value. Okay. So this uh, inform information is based on the count, like one, two, three, you count it and you put the value. How much count is that? You put that count. Okay. Sum whatever it is but without any decimal points for example how many students are present in the class so there is a count for example there are six students present in the class you can't say 6.5 people attended the, the meeting 10.4 people attended the meeting you can't say that it's either 10 or 11 it's either 6 or 7 okay like that so these are based on, based on counts. How many parts of the ship uh, uh, the shipment was damaged? Okay, you can't say 5.5 uh, shipments are missing. No, either five shipments are missing or six shipments are missing. So it's based on the count. That is discrete data. Okay, here you use the bar graph. Continuous data is where decimals have a value. Okay, it's a, it's, it's, it's in a, it's in a continuum. Okay, continuous data it can have any numerical value okay and it can be subdivided into finer and finer values like um, one is a numerical value but 1.1 is also a numerical value that point 0.1 is a subdivided segment that also has a value okay for example when you take a height when you take measure the weight okay length size width okay it comes in decimals Des height is also like 160.4 centimeter so 0.4 is the millimeter so that also has a value okay so that is continuous data so steps in data collection you have to make prediction you have to make a questionnaire predictions is like make assumptions first and then you have to either you have to work towards your assumption and you may either prove your assumptions wrong or you may prove your assumptions right. That is how you start a research. Make predictions first. Then write a questionnaire. Make a questionnaire that can collect exact data that you wish to collect. Then you distribute the questionnaire. 
and collect back the questionnaire when the when people have your sample site have answered it. Okay, the collection questionnaire will be collected back. Then you have to make a results table. So when you collect the questionnaire back, you have to put the data from the questionnaire into a table format. Okay, how many people said yes? How many people said no? Okay, for which each and every questionnaire, uh, each and every questions in the questionnaire, a table format will be formed. How many people agree to this? Strongly agree to this? Disagree to this? Okay, so that data you have to put it into a table. Only then it is easier for people to understand. And you have to draw graphs. Graphs are much more understandable than the tables. In, ta in tables, you may have to look through the values to get into a conclusion. But the graph, if you just look at the graph, look at that image, look at that picture of a graph, you will understand what's going on. Okay, you don't have to necessarily look at the values to get a idea of what's going on. Okay, so graph will be formed and then based on the graph, you can draw your conclusions, results. Okay, so that is the steps of data collection. So methods of data collection, you have observations, you just sit and observe like laboratory research, based researches, psychological research, research. It says you can't be a participant of active participant in data collection. You just have to sit back and observe how you, how things are functioning out. Then interview, you will ask questions and you will get answers. Okay, then questionnaire, you distribute the questionnaire and you ask them to fill it up, read the questionnaire, understand the questions, fill up the answer and give it back. And database, database is somebody has already collected data about a particular topic. Okay, you are just going to that website or you are collecting that journal, reading it, reading the database on it and drawing your conclusion. So that's a secondary kind of data collection. Okay, somebody already has collected the data from first-hand information is already there. Yours is a second-hand information if it is a database. Then there is sampling techniques, probability sampling, non-probability sampling. Okay, in probability sampling, each and every participant, okay, has the equal chance of getting selected in a research. In non-probability sampling, each and every uh, sample in the universe does not have the equal probability of getting selected in the research. Okay. For example, in a class of 30 students, uh, if all 30 students' name I have written down and in a cheat, cheat paper and I'm shuffling it and taking uh, one, one pap paper out, okay, one student's name out. Okay, so every student, 30 students per percent, okay, they all of them have an equal chance of getting selected in that particular chit group. That is probability sampling. Non-probability sampling is that 30 students are there in a, uh, in a class, but I only require my, in my research, I require students of a specific gender, okay. Let's say I, I want to do research only on female students. So male students don't have the chance of getting selected. Okay, so that is non probability sampling. So under that also there are different names. Okay, you just have to go through the names. Don't understand that in-depth meaning that is not required. So it's given in the textbook. You can read these names. Then the basic of research that statistics that we use, every, every statistics will have this basic research used. Okay, basic statistics used. Mean, median, mode. Okay, range. So mean, what is mean? It's the average, okay? Sum of the observations divided by number of observations. That is mean or average. So you will be given a set of numbers. You have to add them up, make a total of it, divide by the... Am I audible? Is my screen visible?
Am I audible? Is my screen visible? So mean it's the num sum of the observation divided by number of observation. Simple formula. Then you have median. To find out the median, first you have to arrange the observations in either ascending order or descending order. Okay. Smallest to the big, biggest number or biggest number to the smallest number. In any way, you have to arrange it. Then find out the middlemost part. Okay. If, if it is an odd set of observations, you will find a single digit here. That becomes the median. But since the observations are even numbered, okay, in middlemost, you will find two numbers. You have to add them up, okay, and divide by two. So th three plus six gives you nine, divided by two gives you 4.5. That's how you find the median. Then mode is the most repeated number, most common number. So three has been repeated two times in this set of observations. So mode is three. Okay, a, a data set can have more than one mode. Okay, here according to the numbers given here, only three is, uh, three is repeated. So three becomes a mode. In some data sets, more than one number, two number is repeated the uh, equal amount of times. So that becomes the mode, okay? Then what is the range? It is the difference between the highest number to the lowest number. Okay. If you see nine is the highest number and one is the lowest valued number. Okay. So nine minus one, eight. The range is eight. Okay. So that's how the basic concepts of statistics are used in Six Sigma. Then you have normal distribution curve. It has certain characteristics. Okay. Like it's a bell shaped curve on both the sides, it is equal. It will never touch the x axis, that is the line here. X axis is the line here. Okay, it will never touch it, it will just go parallelly to it, but it will never touch the zero. Okay, the central most part of the normal distribution curve is the mean. And any data set, any data set in which Any data set in which mean, median, and mode is equal. What is the uh, value of mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. That is a normal distribution curve. Okay. Everything lies in the center. Okay. So standard deviation in a store normal. Uh, what is standard deviation? How far away are the data from the mean? Okay, because in a data set number, there are numbers who are very far away from the average. Okay, either less than the average, more than the average. But a data set will have everything. Okay, the numbers that are very far away from the average, very close to the average number, every uh, close to the mean number. Okay, so that is found out in standard deviation. So in a normal distribution curve, it is said that 68% of all the data in your data set Okay, is between is within one standard deviation. Ninety five percent of all the data in your data set is within two standard deviation. Ninety nine percent of point uh, seven percent of all the data in your data set is under three standard deviations. Okay, so this is the normal distribution curve used in research. Okay, it has its own characteristics. It is equal on both the sides. The entire area, this blue area that you see, okay, the entire area under this graph is equal to one. Okay, one is the value of this entire area. So there are some characteristics mentioned in your textbook about normal distribution curve. You can just go through it. So that's about today's session. If you have any query, 